right? You wanna? I'm I'm going now. Can we reboot? Or, yeah. Go ahead and bring it up and turn off your sound there. Okay, folks. Howdy, folks. I'm Keith Bowen. This is Hard Rock University. We're trying a little bit different layout here because somebody mentioned that couldn't hear Eva very well. There she is right back there. I'm the only person here. <laughs> oh, now there's three people. And uh, so we're, we're trying this out. Lighting looks a little odd, a little Halloween-ish, but that's okay. I've got a pretty weird face anyhow. So we'll go with it. And... Uh, Got the laugh track going over there. <laughs> okay. So, um, Eva's going to be watching things and commenting in my ear and such as we go along. Uh, from last week, I uh, got that uh, video up from the Rock and Gem show. Uh, for those of you who have seen it, it's just literally one block away from my house is where one of the venues is. So I went and did that a couple of years ago. Um, and I got the video up on the, uh, the new impact mill. And I think that'll work out pretty well. I've only done the one 100 kilo test so far. I've been doing more testing on the, the concentrator. Um, the physics is a little more questionable there. So I'm trying different things, seeing what happens etc etc um and so i've been focusing more on that uh aside from that um selling kettle corn at the uh, pumpkin patch basically and uh doing construction it's still like 100 degrees during the day and we're doing roofing yay so that means I only work till about noon or one because you just really can't go much more than that. And uh, is the, the sound going well a little while? My little bar thing seems to be showing something. So, yo. <laughs> yeah. Can, yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyhow, um, that's been taking most of my time this week. Um, I've, uh, I break for bedrock is on. Hi. Ah, there you go. How's it going? Is this Adam? Um, jaw crusher. Yeah. It, it doesn't tend to wear out as much in some ways, but on really hard rock, like hard bull quartz, if, the movable jaw isn't pinching well, it can wear out real fast. I've gone through quarter inch hardened wear plate in like eight hours. So wear rates can be pretty darn high, even in a jaw crusher. But what I noticed was it was a really hard rock so that when you had the rock here and it's trying to push, it would slide up. It would be doing this. And that's just grinding the heck out of those plates. But, uh, yeah, Adam, um, uh, nice talking to your, you or quasi talking to you. Um, watched your channel for a couple of years now and, uh, was pretty impressed with the, the gold you were recovering by, uh, uh, dry washing. You know, that's, that's pretty cool. I haven't done much dry washing or metal detecting, um, I've tried to do some metal detecting at times, but it was in places where there was lots of junk. And you know how much fun that is. So, anyhow, the, uh, uh, the stuff you've done, was it, I've enjoyed it. It's been pretty cool. He says dry washing is terrible. Um, I understand dry washing doesn't re do real well for the real fine gold. Um for the kind of stuff I'm doing, hard rock, I suspect it wouldn't do worth a worth, worth a darn. But uh, for that that coarse stuff, like on your last video, that seems to be you know fairly easy. Um, 
I, I like to do new things. So I like to try different stuff and learn. You never know when learning something over here will apply to something over there. And so I like to be more a generalist than a specialist. And um, I think that's actually, uh, I, I think I have two strengths. Number one, I, I like to learn a lot of different things. So I am a generalist and I can plug and play. But also I'm a pretty good teacher and I think part of that is, is I remember when I was learning something, what it was that was confusing to me. And so it makes it a little easier for me to try and explain. I also know so many different things in general um, that I try and create analogies that everyone can understand. Let me try and put this camera just a little lower here. Full blown skeptic yeah. says you're a very good teacher. Well, thank applause, you. Applause. Um, I think that's, that's part. First of all, you have to address the confusion. You have to understand what they don't know. And then you have to be able to explain it in a manner that they can understand depending upon what their knowledge base is. If you've got like a, a computer expert, you know, an IT guy versus a car mechanic, you're going to have to explain things a little different in general in order for them to, to pick it up as easily. Um, I had a gentleman here, you know, two weeks ago that was, that was panning and learning how to pan. And he's kind of a computer guy. He's a marketing guy. I'm sure he can type about 20 times faster than I can with a lot less mistakes, but he hadn't used his hands that much to do things like, you know, fixing cars or this or that. And so there was, it was difficult for him to get it because his mind wasn't wired that way. And when you have those situations do, doing the kettle corn, I learned that some people just pick it up, you know, Stir it like this, do this, do that, do, and they just, they get it. No problem. Other people, especially the one thing I notice is when you go to stir one-handed while adding salt with the other, a lot of people just lock up because they're trying to do two different things at once with two different hands. And it's very, very difficult for some people to do. So I had to develop ways of training them so that, they could overcome that that block and it just takes a little while but it's not that hard but uh, so that's it now another thing that might be useful um, I was talking to uh, one of our viewers uh, last week on the telephone and he was talking about claim staking and uh, in a lot of states, you can put up two by two wood posts, and that's fine. But most people put up a two by two wood post by digging a hole in the ground, sticking the post, putting the stuff around it, or setting it on the ground, piling up rocks. It's a lot of work, and it's really not that necessary. Um, I have a technique where I drill a half inch hole in the bottom of the post. Then I take a piece of half inch rod, and if you've got good hard soil, one foot is fine, you know, yeah, one foot. Um, you can just buy some half inch bar stock, you know, so just some round bar, hot rolled is cheap, and just cut it. And then what you do is you go out, once you locate at the spot you want to put the stake, you just drive the pin into the ground and set the post on top. And it makes it real easy in almost any ground. The only thing it doesn't work well in is absolute bedrock. If you've got good hard bedrock, it won't work. If you've got like decomposed granite, you can probably still pull it off. <laughs> it's not that hard. If you needed to, you could always get a, um, a hammer drill and just drill a half inch hole into the rock, set your pin, drop your post, you'd be fine. Out here we have a lot of termites too, so you might 
want to take your pin, make it a little extra long, and leave it, you know, six inches of pins sticking up out of the ground um, before you put the post so that the termites don't eat your post up. Um, you just put the pins in your backpack and tape the posts together into a bundle, then go out and just start whacking and stacking. Another thing that works very well um, on your two by two post, each post has to be labeled. And the problem is if you write on it with anything in the sun and the rain and in some places they have something called snow I've heard about, it's like frozen dihydrogen monoxide or something. But anyhow, so the weather will get rid of the, the markings fairly easily. So what I would do is I would take a strip of that aluminum tape they use for duct work and such. It's, it's actually a, a thick aluminum foil with an adhesive backing, uh, two inches wide. And I would take it the length that it takes to wrap around the post plus one extra face. And then I'd mark it where the corners of the post would be. And then you just lay it on something like a, you know, a little, something like that, kind of fairly stiff cardboard, and write on it with a ballpoint pen. The ballpoint will put a groove in the aluminum that won't weather out. <laughs> so now you've got, you can write pretty small and precisely once you've got it all written down, then peel the backing, you wrap it around the post, and there's an overlap there. And on the overlap side, you take and just put two staples in there to make sure that you can't unwrap if the, uh, if the glue gives up the ghost. It works really well for your, um, what do you call it, uh, the, the documentation that you need to leave there. You can just cross drill the post and put like a piece of three quarter inch PVC pipe with a couple of uh, slip caps on each end. So you just take one off, slide it out of the post, pull the paperwork out, stick it back in. Works pretty well. And everything right, fits in your back pocket. says that he'll be in contact with you and talk to you later. And Hope Home Skeptic says Arizona has such strong gold grain prospectors. You, I break and nub shooter. I salute you guys. <laughs> Well, thank I think a lot of it is that out here, it's easy to find mines. It's easy to see stuff. It's easy to work it, during the winter time. It's fairly pleasant. Um, you can go places. You know, you can you can walk. You can drive. You, you're not fighting terrain and vegetation nearly as bad as you are in some places. You go like. I was on coastal Northern California one time. We were looking for a mine. Oh my God. We, we didn't come close to finding it because somewhere on that hill buried under 10 feet of, of impenetrable vegetation is a mine. Good luck finding it. <laughs> Out here, oh, there it is, two miles away. I see it. Makes it a lot easier. Corey is here and says hello. Hi, Corey. Hello, Corey. Um, okay, Adam, uh, that's fine. You can call me right after the live stream if you want or else tomorrow. Uh, it's up to you. I'll be going to bed relatively early, but not immediately after the live stream, probably half hour to an hour at the earliest. I have to eat something first, but I uh, appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think we have some things to talk about there that, that could be very helpful. Uh, anyhow, where was I? Oh, back to the staking bit. Yeah. Um, so that's how I like to do my stakes because it makes it real easy. You can carry a bundle of, you know, one claim, you've got seven stakes, you know, a bundle this big of wood, four feet long, seven pins in your backpack, and a PVC tube with a uh, piece of paper in it. Mark Mitchell says, try being in Ohio. I have to drive over a couple of states to find good gold. Yeah, there, there is that too. I know that the we have a lot of mineralization in Arizona. As a matter of fact, what was it? Three C's, cattle, cotton, and copper, something like that. A long time ago, that's what they um, you know, said about Arizona. That's what makes Arizona work. Um, we have, gosh, 
at least a dozen world-class size copper mines inside the state of Arizona. I mean, there's two that, well, three world-class pits that way, less than 20 miles. <laughs> and uh, Howard thought, I think he enjoyed his little tour around those. There's only so much you can see from the road. And with the COVID, the museum's closed and the, the tour is closed. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of, lot of mining down here. And it has to do with the geology in the past, the, the volcanism and the mineral deposition that occurred here. Uh, you're hearing about stakes. No, no, no. Those are those are wood stakes, not the good kind of stakes. Okay, we're we're talking about claim staking. <laughs> uh, cooking with Keith, I suppose I could. Um, it looks like a prospector trip may be down here in late January, early February. Uh, to see the Rock and Gem show. And we're going to try and see if we can set up a live stream, a mobile live stream on uh, you know, a smartphone or something like that and go see the Gem show while live streaming it so you guys can get a, a better feel for what the heck it is. Uh, we can spend all day going to different venues and stuff. It, it could be pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, full blown skeptic says for sure. I got a, I got to work at Green Valley a few weeks as a subcontractor, and it was amazing. Yeah, that's a lot of tailing sitting there, isn't it, uh, uh, skeptic? Uh, I actually do a lot of work down there. Um, I, I I work part time for a small home repair and remodel, and so you know, Sahuarita and and Green Valley, we do a lot of work down there. Um, Right now we're doing a house up here in Tucson. We're doing roofing and fascia board and stuff like that. Uh, but we do kind of everything. So done everything from, you know, putting in doggy doors to replacing roof tiles and everything in between. So it's, it's an interesting job. I, I enjoy doing different stuff all the time and we're doing different stuff all the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to go on the mines, you got to get your M-Shaw training, that's for sure. Claypool, I haven't been to Claypool. Um, that's just south of, well, it's just north of Hayden, isn't it? Um, I've been to the mine north of Hayden there, about 20 miles north. But, uh, you know, it's, again, it's another big mine. I, don't, I think they brought down that uh, smokestack from the smelter, finally. Uh, they replaced uh, the standard furnaces with the enriched oxygen flash furnaces and sulfuric acid production stuff. And I think they eventually knocked down that, that smokestack. Yeah, Skeptic was over by Miami. West of, okay, yeah, Globe. Okay, that's right. It's kind of a triangle there. you got like Globe and Cape Rule and and Hayden there, if I recall correctly. But yeah, there is a this is another spot where there's like three big mines all in one place. Did you ever drive between there and Tucson on the uh, Oracle Road and swing north at uh, uh, the San Manuel mine there and look at the pit? It used to look a lot more dramatic because it was all just subsidence from the mining. And now they actually put an actual pit there and it looks just like an ordinary open pit. But they used block caving at San Manuel and they sucked out man, 600 to 1,000 feet of rock from underneath it. And just sucked down the surface. That's pretty cool looking. Yeah. And Skeptic is talking to you and saying, yep. Yeah. Oh, and Ray, yeah. Ray, that's the one. That's the one just north of uh, Hayden. Absolutely. Uh, Boy and I are discussing steak. Apparently, he lives <laughs> in a place where steak is actually good stuff. <laughs> steak is good. I like steak. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not the best cook in the world. I'm not the worst cook in the world. But I, I can... 
feed you decent and it tastes reasonably good. If you want something really fancy, nah, it's not my specialty. But uh, I think tonight maybe we'll have chili with uh, black soybeans again. And I found out that a little bacon and some bacon grease really picks it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that made the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow um still doing more research on the extraction techniques uh, i did a test today didn't see any visible results now, that doesn't matter because the test i was doing might not show any visible results i might have to wait for the assays I was trying to do kind of an agglomeration test on some of the slimes. So I don't have a head grade for the slimes, and I don't have an after-the-test grade for the test sample either yet. But I, I did a test. We'll see what happens. Um, the concentrator I'm working on, the, the, the modifications I've done to the trip concentrator, um, look like they should scale up re really well. I don't see any reason why you couldn't just make it bigger and bigger and uh, just get more throughput that way. Yes, little one? Corey says that sounds better than kidney beans for sure, and Mark says bacon makes anything good. Pretty much. Bacon bacon helps anything. Cheesecake. Cheesecake, not bad. Uh, bacon will make cheesecake better. Savory yeah. cheesecake is a thing. <laughs> We, Eva has a, a metabolism that's a bit strange in a number of ways. Uh, oh, trying, trying new medications on her is a crapshoot. You never know what they're going to do. But she found out a couple of years ago that carbohydrates are very uh, inflammatory to her. And so she's been on the, a real low carbohydrate diet, the keto diet, you know, um, for a couple of years, it's done wonders. I mean, you saw what we did this summer. Well, two years ago, she was in a walker. You know, when we went to Walmart, she'd get in a motorized cart, and she'd wait in the car while I got one so she could get in it and go go shopping. Um, uh, but because of that, we try and do a lot of things that are um, a little different to to eliminate the carbs. And one thing is. Beans have a fair amount of carbohydrates in them, but they're something called black soybeans that do not. They're basically protein, and they taste a lot like a kidney bean, uh, very, very similar. And uh, so we make our, our own, um, we can our own uh, chili. It's just a hamburger chili, hamburger and tomatoes and some spices and onions in it too, right? Yeah. I think so. And we, you know, one quart jars and one pint jars and, and pressure can it. Uh, it works great on on trips. You know, we can take that and we also can chicken and, and uh, beef and, you know, buck 99 for chicken breast. And we can usually get beef below $3 a pound. If you look at the stuff on sale, you can get it cheaper than hamburger. And then we just can it in like one quart jars. Well, when we're out in the field, we can take like a quart jar of, of chicken and throw in a pint of chili and, you know, a can of, of uh, black soybeans and heat it up. And I mean, we got a really nice dinner, really filling, really, you know, lots of uh, protein, very low carbs when we're out there in the field. So... It's a way we can eat inexpensively out in the field and eat well. Because when you're working hard, you want to eat a lot and you want it to taste good. It's, it's no fun. You're already missing a lot of the pleasures of civilization, which you're getting a lot of pleasures of no civilization. But it is nice to have good tasting food. So let's see. Uh... Please look up those things. 
Okay, I'll leave that up to Eva because Eva is the dietary specialist around here. I am the preparer and consumer. <laughs> <laughs> She's the one who figures out the theory. Uh, but yeah, uh, she'll probably look into it. I would imagine she would. I I don't know. Did you have neuropathy problems, little one? Yep. She yeah. says yes. We're just discussing that right now. Yeah. Anyhow, um, yeah, Eva was, she was having a rough time. I can tell it was tough for her to face each day. You know, that's a, that's a tough thing for her and a tough thing for me. You know, when someone you love is, is hurting like that, it ain't, it ain't fun. I'm so glad she's, she's feeling better. I, it would have been nice if I was running the camera when she had showed up on the top of that ridge this summer. The look on her face as she looks at me and goes, I climbed a mountain. That's like, yeah, you did. Wow. <laughs> How did yeah, you get you up here? Underwhelmed. I, I was startled. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. Let me try putting this down a little lower again. Um, I mean, I would have definitely been less surprised if it if I'd run into a grizzly bear. Uh, I was I was mentally and, and prepared and armed for grizzly bears. Not for Eva to show up on top of that ridge. That was was quite startling. So. Yeah, Old okay. Skeptic says doctors are unfortunately indoctrinated and are mere drug dealers. Well, our doctors actually approve. It, it, it depends on the drug, uh, on the, the doctor. But yeah, to some extent, that everybody in our society wants a quick fix. You know, I, well, I've got a problem. Let me take a pill and I'll be better. And the problem with that is, first of all, pills have side effects. And secondly of all, if you require the pill to act normally, you're now dependent on it. You know, um, years ago when even I first got together, there was an extremely challenging situation that occurred. And uh, she helped me. Um, refine some mental techniques to deal with stress rather than, you know, do these head med things. I mean, I really don't like head meds at all because they change the way you think. Well, you know, people have enough trouble thinking. Um, if you know, you, full blown skeptic says the human body is the healer. It just needs a few things that are very simple, clean water, food, and information. Um, it can get out of whack, but we can get it out of whack too. And, and I agree that if your body is having trouble, if you can figure out how to stimulate it or adjust your environment or whatever to where your body is going the way it ought to, you're going to be in a lot better shape. I mean, I'm 64 years old. I'm doing pretty good. Um, and part of that is probably just natural. But part of it is just my attitude. I, I listen to my body. And, you know, what, what is it not liking? What does it want to do? I try and maintain a positive outlook at all times. I try and be cheerful because your attitude will affect not only how you feel mentally, but also physiologically. If you run around feeling bad all the time, mentally, it's going to affect your body. And you can use just even such little tricks as... Try and be really grumpy and smile at the same time. When you're feeling down, just smile. Just keep smiling. And it will affect your mental state. It's bizarre. Um, and, and little tricks like that can make a big difference. Uh, I used to have, I'd say, what would you call, bouts of clinical depression in my 20s. And uh, I feel really bad. And then I finally figured out, well, if all I do is get enough sleep and stay busy, it'll go away in a couple of days. It became nothing really much more than a headache in terms of, of incapacitation because I just, I could ignore it. I know it's going to go away. Don't worry about it. William Hansen Don't let it take over. He just likes to listen and watch and he thinks you're great. Thanks very much. Oh, you're welcome. If anybody has any mining questions, feel free to ask. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's supposed to be a mining thing, but I, I feel it's more like a, a community anyway. Um, 
But if anyone has any questions or any topics or anything, go ahead and bring them up. But until then, I'm just going to chatter. <laughs> Whatever comes to my mind. Uh, Jimmy Robertson has a question for you. Okay. I'm from Montana and having the same problem with slime gold. What's your opinion on a mercury sluice like timers done with scant mills? Okay. Problem with mercury, aside from toxicity, environmental considerations, and permitting, uh, and these things can be significant, but from a purely technological standpoint, mercury has a surface tension on it. And that surface tension is much more than the surface tension of water. You know how gold can float on water? It has to penetrate the surface tension of the mercury. So if you just have like a, a copper plate coated with mercury and you got your stuff running over it, the fine gold will tend to bounce along the surface and get lost. That's one of the reasons they went from amalgamation to... Um, either leaching or flotation or, or gravity separation. There's hardly any amalgamation anymore, and that's why. It's not necessarily because of some of the negatives. It's because there's better things out there, and it has a lot to do with that surface tension. Now, there's ways of dealing with the surface tension, but now you, you get into a mechanism, you know, um, and, and where you're actually driving that gold into the mercury. So, say, at the current time, I don't know of any place or any situation where mercury is superior to alternative methods. Now, I'm trying to use the basic concept of coal gold agglomeration to see if you can't come up with something similar to a mercury plate, but with something besides mercury on it. Uh, you might want to explain coal gold agglomeration. Well, just let me keep talking here. <laughs> um, I don't know, many people don't realize it, but the way they recover fine diamonds from the crushed rock at the, at the diamond mines is they have grease plates. It's, it's a plate covered with a particular kind of grease. Diamonds repel water and are attracted to grease. And so is it, as the slurry washes over the grease plates, the diamonds stick and the rock keeps on a going. Well, perhaps we can come up with a similar sort of effect, but for gold, without using mercury. Because there's more than mercury that is interested in gold, and, and organics are one of them. As, as people have noted, you know, you get a little oil in your water, it's going to tend to float your gold. Well, there's a reason for that. The gold is attracted to the water, and then it becomes very hydrophobic. In coal gold agglomeration, they try and get oil soaked into coal, so the coal will stick to the gold, and then that you can float the gold, the coal off. Um, but I don't know why you couldn't use some other medium to hold your organic attractant, and then get the gold to stick to it in a very similar manner as you would a, a mercury plate. Please. But, uh, yeah, Eva's talking about, oh, gosh, what is that compound? Lanolin. Lanolin, yes. Lanolin, wool fat. Um, that's, you know, the golden fleece legend. Well, if you take a, a, a sheep skin that has a lot of lanolin in it, you put it in a stream, and the gold sticks to the lanolin. So there's a number of different materials I want to test. I want to do some research and see if I can find anything that is optimum for a a substrate, a coated substrate type uh, agglomeration setup instead of a uh, something where you have a bunch of particles that you put in with your um, pulp. Whereabouts is Jimmy? What? Whereabouts is Jimmy? Jimmy? Montana. I don't know where That's Jimmy is. Oh, whereabouts? Oh, is Jimmy in Montana? Okay. In just a second. I'm refining my head these days. <laughs> well, Corey, I hope that means that you're 
trying to work on your, your mental um, functioning as opposed to reprocessing <laughs> your ore. But I, I agree, you know, fi find a way to function well using just the tools that your body has. And then you're never dependent on anything or anybody. And in many cases, uh, you have a lot less stress too, because once you realize I can deal with that or I can deal with this, it doesn't have near the fear factor. Um, I've gotten to the point, for example, I figure I can pretty much land on my feet wherever I wind up. So I'm not nearly as concerned about poverty as I was because, okay, so I don't have any money. I don't care. You know, I've got food. I've got shelter. i got two hands and a brain. Rock on. I'll figure it out. Um, so, Jimmy, that, that is a good question. In general, what area of Montana are you from? And uh, another thing that you can run into problems with with mercury is other minerals in the rock can poison the mercury. They can react with it chemically and coat it with uh you know mercury compounds some of which are highly toxic um or they can just fill it with other things besides gold jimmy says he's leaning to flotation with pine oil if i can make a flotation device i'm in southwestern montana okay um i think that that's a very legitimate uh line of research um you also have a surface tension issue with the pine oil water interface and the bubble water and, and mineral interface. But in that case, because you're not trying to keep it in any one spot, use violent agitation. Um, and in a commercial flotation cell, it can be done by injecting air in the bottom with a violent impeller to literally drive the minerals into the oil and bubble interface, or you can do it with violent agitation with just water. I saw a flotation cell once, just a V-shaped trough of steel, and it had a pipe down here with a bunch of nozzles, and basically you'd, you'd put the ore in one, one end, and you'd have the, the tailings go out the other end. And he, he used a high pressure blower, not, a, not an air compressor, but a blower to develop enough pressure to just have a huge volume of air just jumping out of these nozzles and beating up the stuff. And he said he did a pretty good job, you know, of creating the froth that you need. Um, another question, does anyone know where I can actually get the pine oil that they use for flotation and the xanthanates. Is there any suppliers that, you know, are pretty easy to, to get a hold of? I was doing some research on that the other day. And, and the problem is whenever you're trying to search for pine oil, you get all kinds of pine oil cleaners and, and pine oil, essential oil, and all this other stuff. It's like, can I just get some damn pine oil? I don't care about all this other stuff. I don't want a pine oil cleaner that's half isopropyl alcohol or whatever. I just want pure pine oil. So, um, Corey, that's a question. A question for you. Well, he, he observes that lanolin can be bought in a tub in beauty shops. Do you yeah. think there is any connection to paper mills dumping mercury into bodies of water to allow dredgers to collect gold in the mercury cleanup? Uh, I don't think so. Um, the mercury uh, was, was part of the process. I mean, they, they didn't just put mercury in the process for nothing. And they just dumped it because it was cheaper. As long as they're allowed to, it was cheaper to dump it than to re either reclaim it or um, safely dispose of it. Uh, but I don't know the details, but that's the way it was in most stuff. And most of the mercury you find in gold-bearing areas was put in there by, by miners using mercury <laughs> and it just get away from them. Um, but I'm not, I'm not aware of anything in terms of the mercury in the paper mills and, and why that would in any way benefit the miners. Not 
not certain. Don't don't bet your life on it, but you probably bet ten bucks fairly safely. Uh, William Hansen said he's read that mercury is a naturally occurring compound. It's not made man man made, right? Um, mercury is an element, not a compound. Uh, it is a, it is an actual element, and it is natural. And well, in, found in, dripping out of rocks. in some high-grade mercury mineral deposits, you can actually find metallic mercury, native mercury. Um, but it's usually in a, formed in a compound. Uh, cinnabar mercury sulfide is one of the more common uh, ore minerals of mercury. Um, yeah, Corey. Um you don't care much about anything. Well, that is a problem. Um, it is important to be interested in something. And uh, this mining, I find extremely interesting. I mean, I could make a lot of money doing something else. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty smart. I'm sure I could do something and make a lot of money if I wanted to. But I really want to enjoy my life instead. And so... I found that this is intriguing because it's always a puzzle. Every ore body, every prospect, every claim, every situation is a different puzzle. And I go out there and it's like, okay, what the heck is going on here? Then once you find out some idea of what's going on, now it's like, is there any way I can turn this to my advantage? Can I, can I make money? from this situation. So you've got so many different challenges that it makes it really interesting. Um, but finding something that is fulfilling is very important to, to having a happy life. If you don't ask me, mind me asking, uh, you know, how old are you, Corey? And, uh, a lot of young people have a totally different problem with not having interest in, than older people do. So it makes a big difference. Oriel checked in. Uh, oh, gosh. It is very rare, Yoriel. Well, thank you for, for hi from Mexico. I got that, event. Para Sierra. It appears, I believe. Could be. Well, you can probably take that and put in the translator, little one. <laughs> okay, Corey. If you're 36 and you're not interested in much, that's because you haven't found out what it is your that really strikes your interest. It gets that fire in your belly. Um, and if learning the processes really fires you up, then kind of follow that. Um, I presume, since you haven't mentioned it, you don't have any substantial health problems. So at 36, you've got a lot of time ahead. You've got a lot of opportunity. Now, I'm 64. I mean, if I was to go back to school, by the time I got two or three years under my belt, <laughs> I might be too old to enjoy what Leo I learned. said, it seems that gold has a life of its own. It's very rare. Basically. Okay. Um, and... So you have the opportunity, unless there's some other major life situation confining you, to choose an interesting path and start along it, knowing that it's, it's going to take a while to get there, but it's going to be an interesting path getting there in the, in the process. So... You need to let's say find out what really gets that fire in your belly. If this is it, that's great. Then you found something. I've seen people that hadn't find the fire in their belly, you know, 
when they're 50, 60 years old. Um, don't let fear um, handicap you. I mean, let me put that. Don't let unreasonable fear handicap you. Okay? Um, in the United States, in Canada, you're generally not going to die for lack of necessities. Okay? There's some place you can go, some people who will help you or whatever. So that's not... Uh, Mark Mitchell asks, what do you think is the best way to get flower gold without mercury? <laughs> Becomes illegal or stupidly regulated. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, exactly, Corey. Uh, they do tend to get in the way a lot. Um, uh, just saying, let me talk to Mark Mitchell here. Flower gold without mercury depends on the size of the flower gold, but you can, I, I can get good recoveries down to about 200 mesh with gravity without too much trouble at all. Uh, there's various ways of doing it. Um, so that would be uh, the, the first thing you try is just a gravity separation of some sort. Um, in the case of flaky gold, uh, middle fork of the Boise, you know, uh, the gold cube worked pretty well. In the case of the kind of hard rock gold I'm dealing with down here, not so much. Less than 50% recovery. So, sorry. Your screen is messing up. Yeah, I know how that can be, Corey. Um, so... I'm, and I'm working hard, Jimmy, on, on processing that Montana ore and Ryan's ore, too. I think finding a solution to one will lead me to a solution to the other. Um, but, Corey, um, yeah, it is frustrating. Uh, the kettle corn business, that's one of the reasons I want to get out of it. Every time I get something going smooth and the money's coming in nice and steady, and somebody throws a monkey wrench into it. It's never my fault. The city of Tucson decides they're going to change the peddler regulations, or uh, um, I forget the name of the company up there in, in Washington State where we were sitting in front of their grocery store saying, well, corporate decided we're not going to do that anymore. We were down here in front of Walmarts, and Walmart corporate decided they weren't going to do that anymore. Mark Mitchell says he buys ores and crush it so it's small. I guess. Okay. Uh, see anything else for Mark? What do you think the best way to get flower gold without mercury? Yeah, he says okay. he buys ore and crushes it. So it is I presume, Mark, that means you're buying hard rock ore. Um, and so you, you are talking very small. Oh, my gosh. I saw a Tom in the background. <laughs> is that going to mess up your, your That's feet? That's the bald Mexican I, I gotta, that haunts this kitchen. building here. It's, I got to cook it, in the kitchen. Okay. <laughs> it's gonna mess, is it going to mess up your feet? No, it's not going to mess anything okay. up. Um uh, but anyhow, so um, you're dealing with really microfine gold, and it would depend on just how fine that is. Now, uh, is it out here? Uh, let me see. But this right here, you can find out exactly how fine it is until you get down to smaller than a thousandth of an inch, which is about 500 mesh. Um, this is a pocket microscope, and it has a reticle in it. So it's it's like when you look through it, you you've got a ruler sitting there next to your uh, um, image, and you can just literally measure it. And I know that uh, Chris looked this up the other day, and these aren't terribly expensive. Yep, there it is. This is a Fowler 52-662-040 pocket microscope with reticle. Uh, this one, the reticle is in thousandths of an inch. Um, by using this, you can tell exactly, you know, the size of the particles and the shapes to... Uh, better extent that you can with the loop. And that will 
tell you. Gravity will work down to about three, two to three thousandths of an inch. You can get some pretty decent gravity separations. Below that, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Leaching works just fine technically. Uh, it's a little more capital intensive. And the problem is that it's also very difficult to permit, especially if you're, you know, doing a lot of material. Uh, the higher grade ores tend to have coarser gold anyhow. So as a gravity is always a place where I start. After that, I say I'm trying to avoid the leaching because of regulatory and, and capital things. But there are some situations where it works very, very well. I'm also trying to see if I can come up with, you know, some non-toxic leaching solutions. I know they're out there, but I need to research it. And uh, I, I'm working hard on figuring out a way to get that really fine stuff. The basically the 500 mesh minus the stuff that's around one one thousandth of an inch and smaller. Or if you want to go microns, 50 microns minus. That's uh, basically what I'm working Mark on. Mitchell asked you a question. Okay. R running it more gently is important. Also make sure it's well classified. Because if you're running 200 mesh gold and 16 mesh silica, it's hard to separate it. But if you're running 200 mesh gold and 100 mesh silica, it's a hell of a lot easier. So you can also try classifying it fairly finely. Uh, you know, 16 mesh is easy to do. It goes fast at 16 mesh. 30 mesh, yeah, it's getting kind of slow. By the time you get down to 60 mesh and around there, it gets pretty tedious. Uh, some kind of a trommel would probably be your best bet. Uh, you can also set up a vibrating screen with uh, with spray bars or something like that. But get it, uh, get the particles of gang as fine as you can compared to the particles of, of gold, and it'll be much easier to separate. So, so try that. Separate to different sizes and, and sluice them separately and see how that works and let me know. Uh, yeah. So, Jimmy, what have you been trying? What has Jimmy tried so far? Uh, I, stubbornness is important. I, I agree with that. Um, say sluicing, hard rock. Nah, I, I, we were with this Montana ore. We, we tried sluicing some with, uh, I think it was a gold hog mat. It's very, very finely ribbed, uh, specifically designed to capture the real fine gold. And for a sluice, it did capture really fine gold, but we're still losing a crap load. Because I say, it's just, it's just below what sluicing will, will get. Um, Say my, my concentrator is using, you know, some motion. Also, there's there's jigging, there's uh, a rocker type sluice, things like that. You're trying to get some kind of liquefaction besides that. Um, I hate to be a little bit, well, not a little bit, a lot ambiguous here, but I'm trying to to not give away the farm until actually I've got it figured out and I've got something I can sell. Um, and in the meantime, I don't want to mislead people either, um, you know, and send them down the wrong path. So uh, I'm working diligently on it, and uh, hopefully I'll come up with a, a reasonable solution in the not-too-distant future. I'm, I, I'm at 50 60% recovery right now on reasonable ores. Uh, Montana ore, no. Uh, may Mark have to go leaching on that. Know, he'll buy it when he find one. <laughs> I, I'll let everyone know when I got it running. I said, um, trust me, they, that impact mill, I think, is almost ready for um, final production uh, prototype testing. Jimmy says he's got a small shaker table now, but it still flies away. Yeah, even on a shaker table, 
It's, it has issues. Um, what kind of shaker table is it? Is it like an RP4 or, or what? There's, there's not too many small shaker tables. Uh, I have an RP4 I've used in the past. And it did recover gold. And it recovered the cons, the heavy mineral cons, pretty good. But they weren't very clean, which was uh, counterproductive to what I was doing. So I wanted something that was cleaner. Um, but basic idea at this point is something that'll that'll make a concentrate that I can then throw into a cleanup device that will uh, clean it up pretty fast and efficiently. And then the tailings from the cleanup device just go right back into the process so you're not losing it forever. Um, you got another shot at it next time you clean up. Um, I have a question there. Uh huh. The RP4, is that the shaker table that you used to have over at Linda's house, the one that Gonzo and I were um, separating? You mean the, uh, the blue one? Yeah. No, no, that was a wave table. Uh, the RP4 is black top. It's the rib table. It's the Deister table. Oh, okay. And, uh... Yeah, because I was just wondering about that blue table we used to have. That that was a wave table. Yeah, Gonzo and I found we got all kinds of uh, heavies and concentrates when we just let it sit still and let the water run over it very slowly. Do you yes. think that might work? Very fine stuff. Um, was slow for a wave, for for really fine stuff, a wave table might do okay. The problem is the throughput sucks. Okay, we were running a throughput of less than a hundred pounds an hour over this little wave table that we were we we're testing. It was uh, probably 16, 18 inches wide, um, and that's a problem because unless you have a really rich ore and a low throughput, there's no possible way to make money. <laughs> you know, there's just not enough gold in the rock that you're able to process. Um, one thing I did try with that shaker, to, with the uh, wave table, was I coated it with gear oil. I put a little coating of gear oil on it, and that dramatically improved the recovery percentage of but again, it didn't improve the uh, the throughput too much. Uh, Corey has a question for you. If yeah. you want to read the screen. Well, when you have a... Uh, a ribbed shaker table, like a Deister table, a Whiffley table, something like that, you're going to tend to get your high-grade concentrates and your middlings and your tailings. Um, the high-grade concentrates are just that. Um, if you have like a Mount Baker mining type table, uh, that one seems to have a very high percentage of gold in it, then that would be what they call their number one tailings. The number two is uh, a lot of heavy minerals too. And, uh, so that would be good if you, if you have entrained gold, if you got gold in the pyrite, well, you want to catch all the pyrite because it's not freed up. Then you'd want to roast it or something to get the gold out of it. Yeah. Corey says that's exactly what it is. And Jimmy says, have you tried a Miller table? I have not tried a Miller table. I have seen them used and a Miller table has horrible throughput. I mean, it's, it's, you know, put on a teaspoon and process it and stuff. Um, there were some people using them up in uh, the Middle Fork, Boise. And uh, for that particular thing where you're doing dredge concentrates, uh, in my opinion, it was not doing as well as a gold cube. Um, the gold cube did a real good job of catching those flakes. And it did it really fast. I mean, he went through, you know, one day's dredge cons in about five minutes, ten minutes, maybe. Whereas with the Miller table, it took hours. Um, now, I was thinking, you know, why doesn't somebody make a continuous Miller table? You know, instead of having a solid tabletop, 
put a belt. So the belt is slowly advancing uphill while the water is washing downhill. And theoretically, if you got it balanced right and stuff, you might be able to get the goal to go past the water and over the head roll. Um, again, one of the things I've got on my little list of things to check out. Let's see. I believe this was the notebook. Yes, this is the notebook from the uh, trip back. And some of the things I need to check. Uh, magnetic separator, continuous Miller table. Uh, uh, laminar flow thickener, magnetic bottom sluice, sticky liquors as substrate. Uh, dry vape breathing fine screen, <laughs> you know, all kinds of ideas here. And some of them research might be adequate in terms of just looking at the literature and others uh, might have to do some tests. And then the problem when you're testing stuff is there may be a parameter that you're not thinking of. And, uh, then if you don't take that into account, it may not work, even though the basic theory has real merit. Um, so, you know, that's the one of the risks of doing the research yourself. On the other hand, when you're doing it yourself, you learn a lot more than just the basics, too. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, you can try. If you're going to try a wavetable, you might try coating it with some uh, some gear oil or some motor oil and see what happens. I noticed it, it did a substantially better job of collecting the, the sulfides and the gold with that. But the problem I found with the wave table was maintaining fluidization in the pulp beds. Um, I don't know if any of you guys ever saw the first season of Gold Rush, but they got a, an action mining wave table to try and do their concentrates. And Grandpa's sitting there going, well, look at that piece of gold right there, just going right off the end of the table. Well, yes, yeah, as I've run a wave table, and I know why. The bed was packed. The bed was packed because there's too high a throughput. And I say, too high a throughput is probably in the order of about 100 pounds an hour. So that makes it pretty hard. And uh, so when it comes to a standard Miller table, real low production. Um, a wave table is kind of like a Miller table. It's got a flat surface with water running down, but it's using a bumping action to drive the material up. And so as you push stuff up, uh, here. Let's see how well I can do this. Wow. Here you have the table surface. And it's oscillating. Wow. How about that? I can almost in this direction. It's going back and forth. And there's typically a stop here. And so it's going bump, bang, bang, bang. So a particle on the surface will tend to be literally bumped uphill. Now, you put water on the top here, and it's running downhill, and it's pushing the stuff this way. At some point, you have an impondment like this, and they have a little dam, okay? And so right at the top of this wedge of water, the heavies are being pushed uphill and the water's washing them downhill and they get concentrated right in that zone. And then you would typically take some kind of suction device and suck them off. And they will recover very fine gold and very fine sulfides, and very fine other stuff. Okay, the problem is you start putting too much material on and then this area here packs and no longer fluidizes and nothing works. <laughs> it's just a solid block of dirt. So that's kind of how a wavetable works, and they do work pretty well, okay? Just lousy throughput. So I've been doing some testing on that, too. So far, I haven't been able to, again, get anything over about 
50, 60 percent. It's that that last. Well, I want to get total of 80 percent. That's what I'm shooting for. It's that last 20 percent of the 80 percent that's being the bear. I can get 50 to 60 percent without too much trouble. And uh, I have some other stuff to try, but what I, well, I need throughput. And that's one thing. If I do the concentrator with a high throughput, then I can take those concentrates and put them over like you know, a small wavetable or something. Well, that's not a problem. You know, 100 pounds an hour isn't a problem when that's your concentrates. It's only when it's your raw ore that it's a problem. So for a cleanup, device, a wavetable might do quite well indeed, as long as you don't have a whole lot of concentrates per day to deal with. Okay. No, wavetable is just, okay, let's see. Let's suppose this was solid here, okay? And you're dropping water and pulp. Well, actually, generally drop your pulp here. And you've got a dribble of water, a distributor bar that goes across here. So the water's running down this way, up and over like that. And this table is going bumping. Let's see if we can actually do this. That's a good question. Get something here. That's not enough friction. Huh. This may have enough friction. Try it quarter. If you have, if it's accelerating slowly and stopping quickly, there you can see how it's pushing the the wallet up the up the slope. Well, that's the basic concept of the wave table, although it does it many times a second. And as it's trying to bump this stuff up there, the water's trying to wash it back there. And in this area here, you have a pondment of water. Okay? And as such, right here along this edge, you have an equilibrium between water washing stuff down and heavies washing up. And the heaviest stuff closest to the to the tabletop will come the highest up the table. So you have, assuming you had like a high uh, gold concentrate, as you were doing that, you'd have a band of gold, and then you would have a band of other heavies on top of a layer of gold. And this is one of the the things too is on a wave table. I can do it much better this way. Here's your wedge, and here's you got some gold here. That gold, and I'll draw the gold on the bottom here just so that you can see. It may go all the way down to there, whereas the other heavies are up here like this. I mean, think of this all right on that surface, okay? But you'll have a layer of gold that goes underneath the layer of heavies that goes underneath the layer of lights. So there's not like a clean band where all the gold is in it or all the heavies that are in it or something like that. Uh, Jimmy has a question, and so does Ricky. Uh -huh. Jimmy says, do you think we trying to catch the very fine is a waste of time and should do like old timers and catch the heavy and move on? Uh, you can always catch the heavy and stockpile your tailings. Now, it all depends on what the grade is and what the tonnage is. Um, if your tailings are running a tenth of an ounce to the ton and you've only got a tenth of a ton, it isn't worth it. On the other hand, if you got a real mine and you got one ounce to the ton head grade and your coarse stuff is only one third of an ounce to the ton and you're throwing away two thirds of an ounce to the ton, you definitely want to worry about the fine stuff. Up, up in Montana, it was like 80 to 90% of the gold was the fine stuff. Really important. Down here with Ryan's stuff, it's more like 20 to 30% of the gold is the fine stuff. 
and your plan might work very well indeed. But always stockpile your tailings where you can pick them up later whenever possible because <laughs> the price might go up on you. Uh, Ricky C says this is the same principle that a barter table works on, and he likes floating. Um, a Varner table, I'm not familiar with the term. Uh, that may be exactly what a wave table is. Um, wave table was invented. The, the term was uh, action mining. The micron mill wave table was what they called it. And so that's why I call it that because that's the first time I've seen it. Um, flotation, I like the concept. I have no experience with it. So I don't know how well it works, uh, especially for the really fine gold. High wing in it says blue gold gold for the fine stuff. Uh, that probably is not going to work on the 400 and 500 mesh. Okay. Now, I'd be happy to, to try some stuff in a blue bowl. If somebody wants to bring one by, we'll give it a shot. See what happens. Um, if you properly classify it, it may work just fine. I was rerunning some uh, slimes today, and there was gold in it that I think, given the matrix, might very well be recoverable by a blue bowl or some similar type uh, device, some kind of a vortex concentrator. Um, but uh, again, depending on the ore, that your money may be in the four and five hundred mesh minus. Uh, there may not be much percentage above that. Uh, up in Montana, that was the problem. Uh, heck, I could only pan my my standard uh, correction factor was whatever I saw in the pan, multiply by ten uh, from what I would have estimated that was Ryan's ore, and I was getting a pretty good hit on, on what it was with uh, um, Montana ore. So, I mean, that's that's a huge difference. Uh, my slimes were running a higher grade than the head grade. That's some damn floaty gold. So, yeah, when you're only recovering in the 20% range, I think it was, that's you're leaving a lot of gold on the table. You, you really want to try and find something that will do better than that. Mark Mitchell asks, what is there to make fine gold float, just pour it, and then just pour it out into something else? Well, that's the, the process of flotation. Um, if you take something like pine oil is the common one, it's a, it's a liquid, and you mix it with your pulp, and they would typically add other chemicals to make the gold tend to stick to the pine oil better, and then they inject a lot of air, and this kind of collects the pine oil and, and moves it up to the top real well. It makes it float up to the top even better than just the way it would normally float. And then they skim that froth off. And uh, flotation works. It, it's used for uh, sulfide minerals. I mean, it is the standard method of recovery. Um, in terms of gold, I'm not familiar with people who are doing it on real microfine gold. Now, if somebody is, I'd like to know because I want to know how well flotation works on the real microfine stuff. I think, from what I know, that it's a real possibility that this is uh, the magic bullet because it'll recover the intermediate size particles. I, I had a, I had one little sample of guy wanted me to check out up in Montana there, and I mean. About 30% of the gold rejected off of a 16 mesh screen. That was some coarse hard rock gold. Um, I don't know if uh, flotation works well on that coarse of gold, but that stuff's easy to get by gravity separation. So you can just have like, you know, a sluice box running into the uh, uh, flotation cell and, and get that kind of gold. Wouldn't be a problem at all. But I think flotation has a lot of potential merit, but I need to get some experience. I need to find someone who's doing it for gold or do enough experience myself. That's uh, one reason why I like, you know, if somebody can tell me where to get pine oil and xanthanates, that would be nice. I think the particular one I was looking for was like PEX 
uh, and the X is for xanthanate, but I'm not sure. But anyhow, a xanthanate that specifically goes for floating gold along with some pine oil. Hey, Lexi, how's it going? Well, it took you an hour to get here. What is it with that, Lexi? She's fashionably late. <laughs> uh, Corey asks, is that vertical wheel any good? eBay or Amazon would would have both probably. Uh, I have not been impressed with the uh, the spiral wheels for really fine gold. Uh, in some placer applications, it works just fine. Um, but I mean, even the flaky stuff up there in the Middle Fork, Boise, it didn't work very well. It worked. I mean, you got a concentration, but it took a long time to... <clears throat> To get your good recovery, and by then you also got a lot of crud in there, also. So, it wasn't really um, I, I wasn't terribly impressed. Okay. Okay, Jimmy. Um, that's I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, can you ask him? where to get the uh, flotation reagents so I could test these things, because I really would like to. I would really like to test some flotation on uh, the really fine gold, because I think it might be quite doable. Um, in some applications, it might not work to... Um, you know, like in Africa, it might be hard to get the chemicals there. So it's, it might not be an ideal solution, but it's definitely low environmental impact and it's uh, uh, low risk, you know, very low toxicity, things like that. So you're not going to have someone poison themselves with cyanide or contaminate the environment with mercury or something like that. But I need to, I need to run some tests. Uh, some of the things I saw on the internet, uh, 911 uh, Metallurgy had some stuff, and the, the throughput seemed quite reasonable. I mean, in terms of the size devices you need to, to get a reasonable, I think, four ton per, I mean, one ton per hour was something like a, essentially a 24-inch by 24-inch cell or something like that could do that. So that's quite reasonably sized. Uh, it's pretty low-tech stuff. Um, Scott F. says, Keith, enter industrial pine oil in Google, and you will get better results. Okay, thank you. Um, it says, sometimes just knowing what freaking search term to use. Let's see, where's my pencil here? Industrial oil. And again, I need xanthanates. Um, the xanthanates are what they call an attractor. It tends to increase the ability of the pine oil to suck up the valuable mineral. And uh, uh, so that would, you know, it, in, in all the industrial processes, they use them to improve the efficiency. So I would imagine they wouldn't do it if they didn't work. So I need to, to get on that, too. But I think I think the flotation may be the way to go. If not, there's agglomeration or some kind of something like that. But uh, um, say we got a lot, lot of things to check out and do. What I'm, what I'm hoping to do is, is get a, a mine going somewhere where it's making money, and I can spend my, my time full time on these issues, and uh, have the money to, you know, well, I need some PEX. Uh, let's, let's buy a gallon of it and whatever it costs, sort of thing. You know, spend the time to research it, and you know. Here in Tucson, I'm sure there's a supplier. We we'll get these big giant copper mines south of town, um, but I haven't had time to, to worry about it. I've got 
I have limited time, money, and resources, so I got to budget it. But yeah, I could have fun. <laughs> um, flotation, I think, is a, a strong probability. If, if it can't be done, gravity, that would be kind of my next guess with agglomeration as another alternative. Um, leaching, again, it's just it's one of those things, it works. You know, darn it, it works. The problem is it's costly to put together the equipment. It's kind of technically sophisticated, and uh, permitting-wise, it can suck big time. So... Jimmy Robertson, you can find pine oil on the internet. Also, he gets product from supplier in Helena. Um, could you find out the name of the supplier? Uh, that would be nice. We were just in Helena. Oh, well. Um, I'm sure they have a supplier down here, too. But I've just, well, I've been busy. Let's see, what was it? Friday. I work till 1.30 Saturday morning. Then at 9 o'clock Saturday morning, I was working construction for three hours. Then I was back to Kettle Corn 4 o'clock Saturday afternoon to 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> I slept in this morning. Uh, I think I didn't get up till 8 o'clock or something like that. I was just really sleeping in. But yeah, that's what you got to do sometimes. Pay the bills. No sense whining. Still got some testing done this yeah, this afternoon, early afternoon. I was surprised at how much gold I got out of the uh, slimes. Uh, yeah, here we go. Let's see if we can see this here. Oops. You can see that this is gold right here. This area here. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of hard to. Let's see how the lighting works here. Bet you it just completely obliterates it. Yep, it obliterates it. That's a very sensitive webcam there. We've got the lights turned way down here. And that might be better. You know, this, this right here is gold, and it, it no doubt goes back to there. And I got that from the slimes. I was just reprocessing, uh, I don't know, less than a bucket of slimes today to see how much I lost. And a fair amount. When I uh, I'm just taking all my um, super concentrates and putting them in these vials for now. And then when I take these and, and pan down some, you know, to try and get some gold out of it, I bet you I've got. Yeah, at least that much gold in all of those right there. And it may not look too gold right there, but I bet you that stuff's running 20% gold by volume, probably 40, 50% gold by weight. We'll see what happens, but I'll, I'll make a video and show you. The uh, equipment's running pretty, um, pretty routinely now. I'm not having a lot of, oh, crap, and have to intervene sort of thing. So, let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, he passed on a lot. Well, that's unfortunate. It's kind of hard to ask him. Yeah. No, I don't think it's xanthan gum. No, they are xanthanates. 
Um, yeah, xanthinated cellulose for mining, that's more like it. But uh, again, when I have a couple of days where I, all I've got to do is look it up and track it down. Another thing that works sometimes well too is you just find a phone number and call somebody. Um, there's a huge amount of information on the internet, but it's kind of hard to find what you're looking for sometimes. But if you find somebody and just call them and say, hey, look, where do I get such and such? And they, oh, okay, here's where you do it. You know? Let's see. I want to try flotation. How does that work a little bit? Okay, Mark. Um, flotation... And you can look it up on the internet, and you can see a lot of stuff. Uh, typically, it's called froth flotation. Um, it's used in a lot of different things. Where'd my marker go? <sighs> Getting old sucks. <laughs> okay. Let's see. So in froth flotation... You'll have your primary crushing goes to a ball mill and then the slurry comes out of the ball mill. Okay. And you'll have, now this is not to scale. That's just to give you an idea of what you're doing here. Then you'll have a cell. And typically like at the big mines, there's an electric motor here and a drive shaft and here's an impeller. Now that impeller is designed, it's, it's an agitator. That's its whole purpose. And then you inject water here. You have your crushed rock comes in here. And your tailings come out here. And this, it's built up on some sides and not on others. There's also typical paddles here, literally a paddle wheel like that. So that as you bubble this air and it beats the heck out of it, the bubbles rise through this pulp. They collect the valuable mineral. It forms a froth on top here. This paddle wheel skims off the froth, and those are your concentrates. The rest of the rock, crushed rock, stays down here and is sent off to tailings. Now, if you look it up, you can see some pretty good pictures of it. And it's a huge industrial product used in a lot of mining extractions. It's very versatile. Um, Depending upon the frothers, the attractants, the suppressants, basically this is what makes the bubbles, what attracts certain things to the bubbles, what keeps things from being attracted to the bubbles. By adjusting those, you can make it very selective. Um, you can, in, in the Sierrita mine down south to here, they would, would float off all the sulfides, and then they would run those concentrates into another line of cells, which would float off the molybdenum disulfide from the uh, copper sulfides. And that, that molybdenum disulfide was, was clean enough that it was, it was ready to put in like molly grease. Boom, that's it. You just take that, pulverize it, and put it in molly grease. Um, it's that, that clean and precise a cut. So... Um, flotation has the ability to separate a lot of things from a lot of other things. Um, it doesn't have, to, it doesn't rely on density differences. It relies on surface chemistry. And as such, by modifying that, by putting in different chemicals in the water, you can do some amazing things. One hundred percent pine oil, fifty-five gallons, six to seven hundred dollars. Ouch! 
more than I need for testing. But that would be a great place to uh, see if they've got it in smaller quantities, perhaps. Um, oh, 100% pine oil. Did you have a supplier on that, Jimmy? Uh, you got a name of a company or something? Because I'd really like to, to check that out. I appreciate it. Um, say a, a gallon would be plenty for what I need. Um, so it's a little over a dollar a gallon in bulk. Probably be like five or ten dollars a gallon for a smaller quantity, but perhaps I could get it. Uh, if I was going to be using it for an actual mill, then of course the 55 gallon drum would make sense. You don't use a whole lot of it. I think they were running like a quarter percent um, by weight in the slurry, but I'm not sure. Okay, winging it, Tracy. You've harvested pine oil myself. A lot of work. You don't get much, but it's free. So how do you harvest pine oil? Do you, like, boil the, the needles or something like that? I'm, I'm just not sure how you get it. You know, what's, what's the process? I'm not familiar with that. But uh, that would be very helpful. And, uh, again, if I could, you know, get some and it works, then... Theoretically, I could buy a 55 gallon drum. If somebody else wanted to test, I could sell them a gallon. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. Or they could send me a sample and we could see how well it floated. But I, I, I do like the idea of flotation. I really do. Um, I've heard conflicting things as to how well it works on floating the really microfine gold. Chris is here. Hey, Chris. Yes, you're late. I'm just broken hearted. I was I was expecting you to be answering questions I had and, and you're not there. So we're just been, you know, muddling along without you. Actually, uh, Chris is really good at research and stuff. I, I really appreciate all the input he's uh, he's put in over time. And uh, I told you last week, 5 p.m. Sunday evenings, uh, Pacific Daylight Time, which is Arizona Standard Time. MC McClung says look up bulk apothe apothecary website, natural pine needle oil, 5 pounds, 172 bucks. Yeah. For that, that kind of price, I think the 55-gallon drum is looking better. What is this? Oh, my goodness. Some medical stuff. Tommy just decided he had to hand me that in the middle of my live stream with all my thousands upon thousands of viewers. Uh, making pine oil from fat wood. Robert says if he's not testing, he needs to run a couple of tons. Yeah, I, you know, what, uh, what's, what's your grade, Jimmy? Uh, a couple of tons. The crushing and pulverization isn't that hard. My, uh, my impact mill would do that in a couple of days. And the RC-46 would do the jaw crushing quicker than that. Um, actually, the impact mill is now running about 50% of what the RC-46 will do. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, the reason I like 5 p.m. Mountain Time uh, Sunday evening is because one time I'm, I'm usually not doing anything else, so I can schedule it and everyone can, you know, predict it. Any other time, gosh, things happen. 
Uh, I'm not sure yet how to, I know that YouTube has a way where you can schedule and announce and this and that and the other, but again, I don't hurt electrons too well, so it takes me a while to learn this stuff. Um, little one, can you take over for just a minute while I uh, exit stage right? Oh, I'll be, uh, I'll be back in a minute. I'm an old man, so I have to take regular breaks. If you just back up a little bit and look, they can see you. <laughs> Hi. It'll only take a minute. Let me harass the he will be back in just a minute. Yeah, Alexi, I agree. It is a great thing that he is learning. My bear is extremely stubborn, so he is going to keep at this until he finds out what works for people that is financially viable for a small scale or micro scale miner that doesn't require a great deal of permitting and doesn't have a high regulatory burden attached to it and can actually really recover the micro fine gold that you see in hard rock in a way that is cost effective. That's the goal here. A Bear should be back in a few minutes. He is distracting me from my online games that I am, of course, happily losing, but we're talking about trillions of fake coins. So I am currently betting like 5 billion coins a spin on a game on Facebook. And yeah, I'm losing, but oh well, they're fake coins. That's fine with me. A oh. little bit of energy here. It's been a long weekend. Um, Eva's been a trooper too. Um, she worked both both nights out there with the kettle corn, and we we cooked know, 150 pounds of popcorn the last two nights. Not a super production rate, but uh, I mean, with a good three man crew, that unit can do that in an hour. But it's long hours. Um. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, the goal is to to make something that works economically on a small scale that's simple enough and cheap enough for the average person to be able to afford and do. It can't be too technically sophisticated, you know, somebody who has to be a real chemist or something like that. And it can't be too expensive. So that's what I'm what I'm shooting for. And uh, making progress. As I'm definitely getting the with Ryan's or fifty percent recovery is not a problem anymore. The concentrator design looks like it should scale up quite well. The physics looks like it's it's pretty easy to just scale it up. <laughs> okay, Rick, let me see what I'm doing here. I'm having trouble with these electrons and these allergy rhythms. What in the blue tarnation is that? I'll stick with the crate of whiskey and an armful of tacos. <laughs> Well, if you're looking for a flotation device for tonnage that's one-man workable, uh, look for a laboratory-scale flotation cell. Or you can make it yourself. Now, Jimmy, uh, how much throughput per hour are you looking at? Um, because... Say the one I saw, the device, the guy I saw said it would do about one ton an hour. And it's basically four foot by four foot and just a V-shaped thing. I mean, it was it was a heavy beast because he had it made out of quarter-inch steel plate. So, you know, it probably weighed you know, half a ton. But 
it did look like it would last forever. And uh, so it was, it was basically just four foot long, four foot wide trough, pipe down the middle, bunch of air jets. Hey there. Yes, little one. Chris says, I need to get some of the ultra fine ore like you're messing with to play. Most of my ore has chunker gold or is locked in the sulfides. Um, Do we have anything around we can send him? I don't really have much of that to send you, Chris, because it's all up in Montana. We didn't have room to bring much with us. Um, Could we possibly grind Ryan's ore? Ryan's ore. I mean, I got lots of that on hand. It's easy to get. I'm sure I could sell it to you at a, at a very modest place, or Ryan would probably say okay for a, you know, a bucket or two or something. Um, it's running. Oh, what time is that? Almost a hundred percent, hundred and fifty to two hundred microns minus. There's a lot of. A 50 micron minus in it, but it's pretty chunky for harder. At least this last batch has been. As I recall, the previous material didn't have as much of what I consider to be chunky gold. Now, I know you placer miners would find this hilarious, but to me, 100 mesh is chunky, <laughs> you know? And uh, so I'm, I'm not not sure if that's fine enough for what you're looking at, Chris. Um, that stuff up in uh, Mojave 1 might work too, but I don't have any of it on hand. Um, say it's just, you know, I, I've got a, a ready source here of pretty easy to work hard rock. Uh, Chris says, I might take you up on that. It would be good for calibrating my equipment and playing with some flotation recovery. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey, Chris. Uh, we want in on that. Yeah, I, I agree. We want in on that, on the flotation thing. Uh, do you have the chemicals for the flotation recovery? Got the pine oil and xanthanates? Because if you do, I'm sure I could talk uh, uh, Ryan into donating... He says he's got a couple he wants to try. Yeah. I can I can probably talk Ryan into donating some now. Now another question is, do you want the raw ore? Or do you want uh, slimes that have already had the chunkier stuff removed from it? Um say I can I can I can send you anything from raw uncrushed ore to pulverized ore to semi processed ore. So uh, just kind of let me know what it is you need, and uh, I'm sure I can get you some. Because I, I want to, I'm really focusing on trying to get the microfine stuff, and I'd love to do some tests on flotation. So if you're already planning on doing something like that, that would be great. I'd be uh, most curious <laughs> as to how it works out for you. Because I do think that that may be kind of the answer for the micro-scale mining. You're looking to start on 101 batches? 10-pound batches. 10-pound batches. Okay. My screen's cutting Chris it off. Then. Forest hills, right? Yeah, he's in Forest Hill. Um, so... Say, do you, do you want it pulverized, crushed, run of mine? Because I mean, I, I've got the RC46. I can crush it to half inch minus. Actually, more like about three eighths inch minus. I can crush it through the rolls down to something that's approximating 50% passing 30 mesh. I can run it through the impact mill and dry collect it in a bucket. And then it'll be running like 50% passing 100 mesh. Or I can take, say, stuff I collect from, from my process at any stage of it, from, from tailings to slimes or something like that. Um, I 
pointed out to Jimmy asked where Chris was, so I told Chris that Jimmy was in uh, Forest Hills and that Jimmy has Montana slimes. So if Chris is looking for slimes. Yeah, this is what I love about the community sort of things. You have all these different people with different different sets of knowledge and equipment and, and challenges and resources and we can kind of network and, and get stuff together if if you know Chris and Jimmy can collaborate that might work out great as long as I get the information once it's over I I, I big win if I, if I can process that Montana or I'll be happy because that stuff really annoyed me. Uh, co compared to Ryan's stuff, that is a bear. Okay. Okay. Um, I've got some stuff. You're talking 10-pound batches. How many 10-pound batches do you need, Chris? Because... Uh, <laughs> you said 10 liters, actually. 10 liters? Okay. Uh, let me know total how many pounds you want, Chris, so we can uh, go from that. I'm pretty sure Ryan will be happy to donate that if you're going to be doing some recovery testing on it. Um, yeah, and getting? perhaps Jimmy would like to talk to Chris and see about uh, getting some stuff done. Yeah. Uh, then later. Uh huh. Um, so, how many runs are you, do you want to run? I was thinking um, something in the order. I don't know. I have to take a look and see what the shipping costs are because they've, they've got these, you know, like the priority mail. If it ships, it fits. <laughs> well, bags of powdered rock can be pretty heavy, but it will fit. So I don't know. I'm thinking somewhere in the neighborhood of, a, you know, would, would 20 pounds be adequate? Uh, might get you started. Um, you got my email, Chris. So, uh, give me a, um, an amount that you want and where you want it sent, and we'll see what we can do. I'll get back with you via email on that, and we'll go from there. Um, and in terms of that Montana stuff, well, uh, Jimmy uh, might have something for you there, too. So, we might be able to get... All kinds of stuff together. Ah, this is what I like about this. And one thing I really like about this live stream is the interactive thing where people have different little bits of a puzzle we can all put together. The large, if it fits, it ships box is $15. And how large is that? What's the size uh, winging it? Um, I'm not sure, but I'm thinking I could probably get 20, 25 pounds at least into, into one of those things. And uh, that wouldn't be too hard at all. And uh, so, as I just let me know what you want, Chris. I've got some pulverized stuff over here. Uh, some from... Uh, Oh, the Dreamer Prime and some from uh, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Plenty to start planning. Okay. I'll see what I can get you. Send me the uh, send me the shipping address there, Chris, and I'll try and get that out to you this week. Oh, got so many things I'm doing. So annoying. At least some of them are are quite interesting, and uh, I'll say we'll go from there. My thought is the uh, 
the gravity separation uh, might work real well with a with a flotation backup. Twelve by twelve by six. Okay. Yeah, twelve by twelve by six. Yeah, I can get about probably twenty pounds in that. Yeah. Well, good for you, Lexi. Yeah, but pyrite looks very pretty when you find it. Um, and sometimes when it's slightly oxidized, it looks really yellow, too. There was a... There was a guy, another Chris, that brought a sample to me, and I'm, I'm looking at it, and it's like, damn, that looks like gold, but it's in cubes. And, I mean, it... It really looked like gold, but once you crushed it, nah, it was just pyrite. But it had oxidized to where it had that nice buttery yellow look to it. It was it was really deceptive looking. Um, Chris, if I can get something to stick to it and verify it under the microscope, yep. that's a start. From there, figuring out the frother becomes the trick. Well, you might check with the uh, nine one one. Metallurgy's website. He's got some stuff too that might help you out. But uh, yeah, calcopyrite. It it looks pretty gold colored there. But th this was actually pyrite. It wasn't calcopyrite. That was the funny thing. Now the, the craziest stuff, Chris, is uh, Cherokee down there in uh, the Randsburg area. She's got some stuff. And I swear, it looks like gold. It doesn't look like biotite. Um, it acts more like biotite. But it's gold from every direction. It shines gold when you shade it. All the optical tests say it's gold. But density-wise, no. It's not concentrating like gold. It could be really thin gold. It could be essentially gold leaf. Um, she was going to send off a sample for assay. She's from a gold-bearing area there, so it could very well be gold, but I've never seen gold that light before, although that Middle Fork Boise stuff was light enough that it would, it would show on the surface of the black sand. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> yeah, it, it it can be it can be weird, but uh, say so I I just learned if you're not sure, you're not sure, and don't you know don't fool yourself, don't fool other people. Just tell them I can't tell. You know, it was frustrating because I was hoping I could give her some kind of an answer. Um, and I was not able to, um, because it, it was ambiguous. I was getting mixed signals from this stuff. It was very frustrating. It was crazy stuff. Yeah. I mean, I've seen biotite that, that looks like gold, but not from every direction. <laughs> I mean, literally, you could, you could look at it from 90 degrees different. Still looks like gold, that, that opaque, reflective yellow surface. You know, shiny. It, it was... It was really, really odd looking. It just, it didn't have the density. But, and you know, what does it take? A couple atoms thick, and it's opaque. So it could just be real, real thin gold leaf. I can certainly see how gold could form a surface coating on something that could wind up looking like that. See, and that's what I'm thinking, Chris. You know, actually has a micro layer of gold on the surface of the pyrite crystals. That's what I'm wondering if that's what this stuff was, was a micro layer of gold that had formed on something else and then peeled off. But, uh... When you get Tracy points out, pyrites will shatter, gold will smash flat. Yeah. These, these flakes I'm talking about, I mean, they were really, really thin. They're quite small. 
and uh, they were a little too small for me to like take a pin and try and bend them, although that wouldn't have been a bad idea. I might have been able to find some big enough where I could have done that. I was in the field, though. I'm sure I could have found something. I got those forceps in the first aid kit that have real sharp points. I probably should have tried that. Because biotite will break and flake, whereas the gold will tend to bend. Um, but yeah, we shall see. Uh, and uh, I say, I don't know. So, what did you think of my new impact mill design, Chris? Does that look like I can rebuild it pretty easily? Someone named Chase just checked in. Glad to hear your professional technical perspective. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how professional and how technical, but we we try and do the best we can. Um, if you have a question, we can do our best to answer it. Sometimes it works well, sometimes not. Yeah. I agree, Chris. That that that's what I'm thinking might have been happening there, because just say it looks like gold leaf, and I'm thinking that maybe if it is, there's a fair amount of fair amount of it in the sample she sent me. It was not it was not trace levels. Trust me. It's hard to judge when it's that fine, but yeah. I understand, Chris. So far, it doesn't seem to be a problem. The bearings have shown no signs of failure. Um, you know, it's it's early, basically. But the um, to put a, a bearing on the other side gets pretty complicated um, and hard to keep them clean and stuff like that. So. I figure I'll just keep running it, and as long as it keeps working, I'm not going to worry about it. I mean, if you had to replace a, you know, those are $35 pillow blocks. So if you had to replace a $35 pillow block once a week, I don't think that would be a huge expense. Um, but it's, it's definitely hanging out there. But on the other hand, it's pretty well balanced. So there's not a whole lot of, you know, forces on that bearing. It's just spinning inside the bearing. There is a bit of vibration there because it's not perfectly balanced. The belt itself flops a little bit, but that vibration is used to feed the material in uh, from the bucket. So um, until I start having a problem with durability of bearings, I'm not going to worry about it. The, the one thing I had to do had one bearing failure, but that was because getting that old impeller out, it had seized in that bearing, and I could not get it out of there. So I literally had to cut the impeller off the end of the shaft so I could pull the two bearings off, get them in a vise. Then I could get it. came off fine then. But by God, trying to get them to dr that shaft to drive out while it was, the bearings were mounted on the thing just was not working. So when I cut the shaft, I cooked that one bearing that was closest to it. I think it's it still seems like it would work, but the grease has been coked a bit, so I um, just put it as an emergency spare. Jeff Bybee has a question for you. Okay. Any experience with roller mill to flatten gold while shattering magnetite? Okay. Um I have not had big enough pieces of gold to worry about that. I understand what you're basically saying. If you have chunks of gold and, and chunks of magnetite and you squish it, the magnetite will shatter into smaller pieces, whereas the gold will tend to squish out into longer flakes, and then you could screen it. And that might work. I have no experience with it. Uh, with the roller mill like that, uh, the RC46 does have a roller mill, and uh, it will flake clays. But 
as the rolls are coming together, the thickness of the material bed in the crushing zone is the thickness of the flake. And these mm, 64th to a 16th of an inch thick. So to get that to work, you're going to need to feed pretty slowly. You're going to have to feed evenly and slowly across your rollers to try and, and make that happen, if it would. You'd have to have fairly good-sized chunks of gold, though. Yes, little one? Uh, Chris says next time you put a new shaft in, extend it a few inches and put it in a Teflon bushing. Um, Dee Dee Holcomb wants to know if you were wondering if you were able to do a strength test on the unknown gold you were talking about a few moments ago. No. Um, that unknown gold were little flakes. They were... You know, little flakes like this, um, essentially in sand. It's what you would expect to see if you had like mica flakes, but they didn't look like mica. Uh, mica has the effect of whatever angle you look at it, it changes the color. It, it can shine a bright yellow here, and then it's more like a dark gray there. And this, from all directions, it looked the same. Another thing with mica is that generally if you shade it, if you put it in the shade, it will no longer look yellow. It will go more to that dark gray or whatever. Um, this didn't change. More questions on there. From it, it, it really optically looked like gold. And it was too small to do anything else with. Okay, let's see. What am I looking for next, Lula? Uh, Chris says you can try a ring and pop pulverizer. Mr. McClung says the new mill now seems more modular and easier to repair or replace wear parts. And then Chris asks if the material was coming from a granitic contact. Not sure, Chris. I wasn't there. Uh, looking at the other minerals, it could very easily be from a, a granitic type material. Um, but I'm not sure. Ring and puck, I guess that's a ring mill where it runs around inside. They have like a, a rotor that has rollers that are running in a racetrack, and the centrifugal effect gives them a false weight, so to speak. Um, those work too. Again, anything that's, that's trying to squish the material, if you're going to try and squish the gold to turn it in flakes and crush the other stuff, you're going to have to have a fairly thin layer of material between the, the, the crushing surfaces. Mr. McClung points out balance will always be a key factor with that type of mill. Uh, Ricky C. mentions classification. Yeah. And Dee Dee says, I was afraid that would be the case being so small. Yep. Um, and extend it a few inches and put on a Teflon bushing. Okay, Chris. What specifically do you mean by extended a few inches and put on a Teflon bushing? Um, what's the purpose of the bushing? Um, ring and puck rolls the material between the inner surface of a hardened ring against a hardened puck with an eccentric. Okay. Uh, again, anything where you're squishing the material... Um, if you're going to make flakes of gold and powder of something else, it'll depend on the thickness of the material bed. Uh, they also have something called a, a high-pressure roller press that they use in uh, uh, the big mills here. And it's like a rolls crusher, except it's choke-fed, and it squeezes the rock. It's not designed to, to pulverize it fine, but it just puts enormous compression on it. And it does some crushing, but it, it stresses the rock to where it's all kind of like pre-fractured and fragmented. So when you drop it into the ball mill, it just comes apart a lot easier too. And uh, they call that a high pressure roller press. And basically the material bed can be like this thick. So it's not, you know, it doesn't crush the rock to, you know, anything less than, say, one and a half inch, although they, they will break up more than that. But 
the rock that's left has been so badly stressed that it's a lot easier to grind afterwards. Uh, yeah, I don't think the MD-20 would work on the, the stuff that uh, Cherokee's got. It's pretty small. Pretty darn small. Uh, on the outbound end of the shaft mount is split sleeve on the housing and slighted Teflon bushing on the shaft to constrain any motion if it gets out of whack before it self-destructs. Um, okay. That's possibly one thing I found out is when I had a, uh, a rotor actually fail, the weld cracked. This is before I put those little bracing <laughs> straps in there. Um, as soon as it started to fail and got kind of cattywampus in there, it started dragging against the housing, and the friction just brought it to a controlled stop. Um, I was surprised at how effective that was of just slowing it down and bringing it to a stop. Uh, I would have kind of thought there'd be like a catastrophic failure with some really loud noises and me diving for cover like an incoming artillery barrage was happening but it just went because <laughs> as soon as it got a little bit out, it just started dragging and that friction was too much. A little six horsepower engine doesn't have a whole lot of power to just overcome anything. I'm thinking on a, a larger mill, you'd want a longer distance between your pillow blocks also to kind of prevent that. I suspect the one inch shaft is adequate. Um, but I mean, the pillow blocks are only this far apart. Um, you know, the, the distance between the, the race of one and the race, of the other is like inch and a half, maybe. So that, that, you know, doesn't give a lot of leverage of the bearing onto the shaft. It gives the shaft a lot of leverage onto the bearing, but so far it has not been a problem. Uh, sometimes, you know, my philosophy is if I think it's too weak, run it to destruction and that'll tell you. If it doesn't come apart, okay, fine. The housing itself being quarter inch steel, uh, if anything tries to come apart, I'm pretty confident uh, any fragmentation will be contained. Uh, while it comes to a, a stop. But there's a lot of momentum there, for sure. Just pull starting that thing? Oh, yeah. It's not like, ringing, ring, ring. It's like, It's pretty funny. But it works good. <laughs> uh... I have not used a chain mill. I'm not familiar with using chain mills. Um, the reason I don't is because my particular purpose is to actually get a draft efficiently blowing through there so that I get material transport as a part of the milling process. My mill not only breaks the rock, but it blows the rock out and it blows it up through a column so that any oversize, you know, you know what coarse sand basically has a good chance of falling right back down in the mill and getting beat up again before it goes anywhere. And it seemed to me that the, the chain mill uh, would not do nearly as good a job at creating a draft. I may be wrong. I, I don't know. Again, I, I have no familiarization. It would probably be simpler to build, although that rotor, trying to think, cutting all the pieces using a chop saw, drilling all the holes, and welding the four big plates to the shaft took me in the order of about four hours in just a very, very basic shop. Um, 
if you were to plasma cut those pieces, you know, with a CNC plasma cutter, the welding, the rotor together, half an hour, it's not that hard to do. Um, there are certain ways you can space and, you know, use fences and this and that and the other to put it together pretty easily. It's, it's not that hard to do. And uh, so... I didn't see the benefit of going to a chain mill. Uh, say I'm, I'm trying to achieve three things at once with the mill, not just beating it up. Because because one thing a lot of people don't understand is in an impact mill you can get a wide variety of particle sizes. I have an action mining mill that we bought years ago, and using wet screen classification was just ridiculous and it just it, it would not grind stuff fine worth the crap i get much finer grind using air classification like this uh in the case of a damp ore it might be a real problem where you might have to go to wet grinding and then i think you're probably going to have a tough time using the air classification i don't think it'll work we'll see Counterweight matching the rotor, it, it had to be a big counterweight. Uh, it would certainly ease some of the stress on the bearings in the shaft. You'd have to have a, uh, it would add substantially to the weight of the mill, and you'd have to have a bigger uh, guard out there um, to, to cover that. Right now there's a six-inch pulley that it's, it's covering. You'd have to have... Gosh, a chunk of steel. I mean, if it was the same size as that six-inch pulley, uh, you'd need something probably an inch and a half thick, something like that, just to get the weight. Um, and I'm really not sure how much it would help. Your, your vibrational forces, I would think, are going to be vastly greater than your just weight of the of the mill. Uh, the, the rotor itself only weighs, I don't know, 15 pounds, 20 pounds, something like that. Um, whereas the out of balance vibration that you get uh, makes the whole mill vibrate. I wouldn't call it substantially, but significantly. That, and that vibration feeds the material from the bucket. But I would think those forces would be harder on the bearings. We'll see how well they last. If, if they last fine, then it's not a problem. Uh, but, yeah, that would reduce some of the strain. Then pull, put the pull cord on the flywheel. Yeah, but it doesn't retract. Yes, you could. You could definitely put it on the flywheel. Um, let's see. A hydro cone for classification thickener. Um, yes, I know what you mean by a hydro cone. Uh, it's basically like a dust collector, but it works wet. And uh, they're used a lot um, for both classification and thickening. Thickening means reducing the, the liquid content of a pulp. Um, and there's, there's times you do that. Uh, and in, a hydrocone certainly has certain... Uh, it does certain things. I'm wondering if you had a high-speed hydrocone and use, you know, tried thickening with that, and then also use just a standard, um, basically a wide area thickener where it just settles to the bottom. If the gold would react differentially between the two, if under the high G forces the gold would be easier to get to the bottom than under the low g-forces or whether it would still be basically about the same if they react differently then by doing them in sequence you might be able to get a good concentration yeah with wet you need a regrind circuit and oversize yeah that's what i'm uh, I'm, I'm i'm thinking might be the problem if you if you go to wet grinding Right now, the, the dust is not a problem. By using that dust collector and creating a, a negative pressure in that system, 
Uh, there's very little fugitive dust at all. I also found out that if you just squirt a little water on any crack or whatever this is leaking dust, it real quickly seals it up. Yeah, uh, we can complicate it and improve certain things for sure, Chris. The idea is to make it as, as absolutely simple, as cheap as possible. And, and see what we can get away with. If we have to add complexity for durability or something, that's fine. I'm, I'm hoping I won't have to. How do you add drip this? How do you add? I'm not sure, Ricky C., how you add drip. This is how you add to sell. Most people are afraid of flotation. Um, yeah, a lot of people are afraid of float. If you're using a gravity concentration, you don't want flotation. Yep, and I don't. Right now, I'm just running it with nothing in the water at all um, to see what happens. So far, I'm getting pretty good recoveries. Uh, I'm glad I was able to help Dee Dee. Chinese rocker box. Yep. Chinese rocker box should be pretty effective down to some pretty fine gold in my opinion recent experiments i've done indicate to me that the physics in a rocker box are actually pretty darn good for getting fine gold absolutely chris georgie says once you get down to very small particles flotation or chemical methods become the only saving option to keep any food you may be you may be absolutely correct. Although I I throw in agglomeration also, okay, and flotation is kind of like agglomeration, in that you're trying to get the gold particles to stick to something that separates from the rest of the gang. Uh, in the case of flotation, it's uh, you know the, the the bubbles. If you could agglomerate, then you could do it without a lot of mechanism. For example, if you were to have uh, well, let's let's just say pine oil works real way, and the gold will stick to the pine oil like son of a gun. Well, what happens if you soak some uh, excelsior in pine oil, and then run your slimes through that, and then when you're done, you could either ash the excelsior, or you could rinse it in an organic solvent to free up the gold again. Don't know. Doing experiments. So far. Indeterminate. I, I, I need some assays to come back before uh, <laughs> I, I have a good idea. Okay. You can tune the cyclones to recover very specific sizes of gold. Well, if, if your gold is that you're losing is all, you know, 50 to 20 micron, that might work pretty well. Okay, see, we're, we're kind of thinking together. Burlap is another one. Turpentine and Vaseline, burn the result. Yep, you can also rinse it in gasoline and then filter it. <laughs> you know, might be an easier way to, to get your result. Then you could, you could essentially vaporize and condense the gasoline or whatever organic solvent you used. Um, and... Recover that and recover your original materials and put it back on the burlap and go for it. Pine Sol has pine oil in it. It is not the same thing. Pine oil is one of the ingredients in pine Sol. I think there's also a, an alcohol and some other stuff too. I know there's detergent in there, some kind of surfactant. So... Uh, so I was trying to find just the straight pine oil because with pine sol, you're trying to get the greases to emulsify with the water. Whereas with pine oil, you want it to separate. You know, if you're trying to float, you want to separate these things. You don't want emulsification. So that's one of the problems. There's loads of pine oil cleaners, but trying to get just pine oil is a lot more difficult.
And and how well did that work with the burlap, uh, Chris? What what size were you recovering? And in your estimation, what recovery percentages were you getting? Because that's uh, essentially what I'm thinking of doing, uh, especially for artisanal miners in the third world. And uh, say if, if something like that would work well, then it uh, could save a lot of um, risks from cyanide and uh, environmental risks from the mercury and, and direct mer risks from the mercury. Picking up a bit of extra flower gold. How much do you think you were still losing there, Chris? And Dee Dee, ask. That's the whole the whole thing here. We want we want to be an information source. As you can see, Chris here, he's a hell of an information source too. Any guesses, Chris, on uh, how much it it, it might have changed? Because that's I say that's a process that would be easy to uh, to work in the third world if you had a good collector on the burlap or whatever it was you were using. But ashing is not necessarily twenty percent of minus four hundred mesh. Okay, say so significant. And uh, we'll see what happens. But these are the sort of things, Vaseline and turpentine, okay. I've got that in my head here, so that's one of the things I'll be checking too. I thought the old world was sheep wool instead of burlap. Yes, they did, Dee Dee. And uh, with the uh, lanolin still on it, the wool fat. Um, but I don't think you're going to find too much of that, say, in Zimbabwe. So... In order for flotation to work, I don't know if it has to be continuous flow. It's more efficient if you have a continuous flow process for sure. I will definitely agree with that. But I think you could do it a batch process. It would not be as efficient though. The, the, the equipment would be larger for the throughput. Okay, Chris, yeah. Lab scales is batch mode, I say. I'm I'm sure you can do it either way, but continuous flow generally you get much higher throughputs for the size of the equipment, etc. Um, it's also a lot easier to integrate into a big system when you're not stopping and starting and moving and this it just gravity works sort of thing is is a much better way. So, yeah, I, de I definitely want to do some stuff on flotation. So, um, it looks like you've got a head start on me on the flotation, Chris. Um, I'll see. Make sure you send me an email to remind me and give me the address to send, uh, send some stuff. I know I've got some pulverized material right now um, from two different areas that are both relatively good gravity separatable stuff with some fine gold, you know, micro fine in it. Um, so I could send you some of each. Uh, not a, not a huge deal. The only reason I thought the, uh, I want one of that stuff from, uh, uh, the dreamer prime. It's cause I didn't have anything else. Now that I've got Ryan, I've got a supply, not a problem. Yeah, two tons per hour with recirculation of wash water. Yeah, that sounds about right. You know, and even that's what, Chris, about a two to four square foot cell, something like that. Flotation has high throughputs for the size of the equipment. It's, it's really quite efficient uh, in terms of size and cost of the equipment. The negative to flotation is you have to have 
um, chemicals that you add to the water to make things happen. Six station, four cell. Six stations, four cells each? Wow. Do you have any experience in using silicone mats for capturing flower gold? Not in terms of other people's mats. I have some stuff that I'm, I've currently put silicone on the bottom of it and, and put ribs by using a notch trowel that I'm doing some testing on. And I'm using a variety of different potential recovery methods. Um, and so far, the stuff that's just the pure ribbed silicone hasn't been getting a lot of gold because I don't think it's getting that far down the system yet. Um, I have not seen it do a better job of recovering than what's upstream of it. And um, I may have to sit there and literally swap some things out and put that box ahead of the other one just to see what happens um, because say it, it hasn't been doing too much but then as far as I can tell it hasn't been getting too much the gold seems to be stopping whatever gold gets into that box seems to be stopping pretty quickly uh. Residual per station IRC. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by IRC, Chris. Laundry water reprocessing tends to get about 20% of the residual per station. <laughs> I, I know that you're using a lot of the water over and over again. You'll, you'll run a particular slurry density and then you'll use a a thickener to increase it for disposal and recover the water. But uh, there's still, you know, you're going to be losing some. Now, if you dewatered everything, um, you could probably recover 90% of your water. But anything less than 10% water in your, uh, in your solids is, is really, really, really tough to get, even with vacuum filtration. So you're going to have some losses. That's just unavoidable. But that's, you know, if it's cheap enough, it's not a big deal. There's, all, there's always costs. Nothing's free. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you're working on the flotation thing, Chris, because I'd like to have some, some answers on that myself. Um, I don't have uh, any real opinion on good, bad, or indifferent on that uh, mat, DD. I would say this. If all your gold is up in the head of your sluice and you don't have much down at the bottom of your sluice and you can't pan anything out of your tailings, you're getting good recovery, as, at least as good a recovery as you can detect. So... That's what I would, I would look at the concentration of the sluice. If the concentration of gold all through the sluice is about the same, then I'd say it's not doing a very good job because it should be up at the, the upper end of the sluice is where all the gold should be. So that'll tell you how well that mat is recovering that gold. Yeah, uh, the real fine sizes... Yeah, the water itself is just too turbulent. That's why you need something to actually stop the gold. Um, yes. I think it's Mr. McClung, M.M. McClung, something like that. Uh, yeah, that might very well work fine. Although, instead of sheep wool, I'm thinking they've got some, 
some oil recovery mats they have now for environmental cleanup that'll suck oil right out of a, uh, a water stream without effect without absorbing a bunch of water i think that might be the best thing to soak your oil on but yes that might work quite well yes and uh, the length of the sluice is important too. that's that's why uh, if you can see how the distribution of your your gold is in the device i say right now in my second uh, tray of my concentrator the total gold is the recovering is 10 to 20 percent of what it is in the upper tray and of that gold most of it's in the upper end of the lower tray with a little bit right at the outlet where there's a little lip but uh, that's you know kind of thing I'm still I just built these trays and the, the physics Plus, I really would like to have a better control over the, uh, the speed of things. Uh, hey, little one. Yes. Chris says, Lanolin works nicely as a collector. Doesn't <laughs> surprise me, the golden yeah. fleece. Okay. Uh, Chris Georgie mentioned saltation. And... Uh, Jeff said, what is salutation? It's saltation. Salutation is a greeting. Yeah. And Chris is right, although it might be a little hard if you're not seeing it. So let me get my little clipboard here. No, get something bigger. Okay, there's the bottom of your, uh, the solid bottom of your flow. And here's... This is water flowing along. Individual particles, if they're big enough, they can either they can sit there. If they're a little smaller, they'll tend to roll along the bottom. But once they get a little smaller, then they call it what they call saltate. They'll hit the bottom and bounce and hit the bottom and bounce. It's not that sh sharp a, a parabola, but they basically do this. And they'll come up and they'll bounce and they'll come up and they'll bounce and they go along like that. That motion is called saltation. Don't ask me why. Chris probably knows. <laughs> uh, let's see what we got. Most mines have been abandoned. I heard most of the mines in the Medicine Bow area were still producing gold and silver when shut down. Were mines in national forests forced to shut down? In some cases, yes. other cases, no. Depends on the particular administrators of that particular forest and how obnoxious they were. So they could have been shut down for other reasons besides the ore body itself petering out. Okay. Uh, Chris Georgie says, for lanolin, not sure how to get it to act nicely for flotation, but for a grease plate or a media, it works well enough. Just messy to clean up. Um, any idea what dissolves lanolin? I, say, I know that, like for grease, you can just use gasoline, dissolve it, and then vaporize the gasoline, you get your grease back. Just dissolve the grease, filter it, vaporize the gasoline, you got your grease back. You got your gasoline back if you if you condense it. If you use a condenser, not a problem. Most of the mines were shuttered for the yeah. A lot of mines were shuttered in in, in World War II. For people who don't know, I believe this is 1943, but I'm not sure. Uh, it was in the 1940s. President Roosevelt closed the gold mines because you don't need gold for a war. You need tungsten, you need steel, you need copper, you need lead. You need a lot of other things, but not gold. So they wanted those miners working in other mines producing critical minerals uh, for the, the war effort, and gold was not considered to be critical. Uh Mining in Leech Town stopped because of water restrictions. Wouldn't surprise me. Uh, environmental restrictions have caused a lot of things to 
either be just forbidden or to become uneconomical. Lipids can get complex. Yes, I'm sure they can. Natural, natural organic compounds generally tend to be more complex mixtures of compounds. Yep. So that wouldn't surprise me, Chris. I'm, I'm looking for something that would do very well on a media like burlap or something like that, where it's a coarse enough medium that you can flow uh, fine material through it, like 200 mesh minus will flow through it instead of get filtered by it. But yet the gold will still tend to stick to it. If we could, if we could get that. And then I think we'd have something that would work well both for a micro scale small you know mine in the United States and for artisanal miners in uh, uh, third world countries. So we'd have something that not only economically useful here and overseas, but also would provide secondary environmental and health benefits overseas. Uh, mercury, of course, is not used properly, and and cyanide is not necessarily used to the safety standards we have here. For example, in Tanzania, I, I asked the guy, do you have an antidote kit? And they're like, uh, you know, what's an antidote kit? <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, and that's where, you know, they have to live. They have to make money. They have to put food on the table or they will starve. It's not the United States. You know, when's the last time you heard of somebody starving in the United States or Canada or even Europe? It doesn't happen. But in places like Africa, South America, Asia, yes, people can starve to death if they don't put food on the table, if they can't earn a living. So they take risks that we would consider to be unacceptable, but they take it out of necessity. And if we can reduce that, I think that would be a, a good thing. So, yeah, I, I kind of like the idea of burlap, too. You, you layer it, you know, a bunch of layers fairly close together, and it would work fine. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they, of course, cyanide's not uh, stable in the environment, so whatever they they lose in the environment, it's, it's not going to go very far before it's it's gone, unlike mercury. Mercury can hang around forever. Um, you say that most tailing piles are worth panning. They're worth testing. Um, you may not find anything, but a quick pan never hurts and also a lot of people are mistaken in the term of the, the word tailings in the mining context specifically means the crushed rock from which the minerals have been recovered and then has been disposed of it will be like a sand uh, a lot of people call the waste dumps at mines tailing stumps, and they're not. Waste rock is the rock that is moved to get to the more valuable ore, and it is just moved and thrown away. That's, that's waste, not tailings. And uh, this stuff I'm processing here, it's a waste dump. It was just thrown out the door, so to speak, and it's running a third to a half an ounce to the ton. So, yeah, your, your waste dumps you always want to check. If it was a gold mine, you want to see what they were throwing away. Because, you know, if they're getting two or three ounces to the ton in the high grade and the wall rock's only running a half an ounce to the ton, they throw it away. But it's still a half an ounce to the ton, you know. Uh, so, let's see. A lot of tanning spiles have been... Reworked already if they were high grade. It's true, Chris. Um, in Mexico, I did some prospecting for a while, and the 
the ore itself was running about a third of an ounce to the ton. The uh, uh, amalgamation tailings were running about a tenth of an ounce to the ton, and the cyanide tailings were running about three one hundredths of an ounce per ton. So, and you could actually see, you know, different tailings piles and stuff. So, yeah, it depends on what you've got. But if they were using mercury and amalgamation or gravity, then a leaching circuit uh, might recover really, really well. Yeah. Um, another thing that can happen with tailings especially if it was cyanided, is the cyanide is not really fast. And so the coarser gold would not dissolve in the time they were processing it. It got thrown away with the tailings, but the cyanide was still there. And so it would tend to dissolve it over time and then tend to re-precipitate it. So it turned, effectively turned the coarse gold into really fine gold. Uh, one particular mine, the King of Arizona mine in Arizona, they were looking at the tailings. They were pretty low grade. I forget. I think it was like 0 0.03, 0 0.04 ounces per ton. But the leaching time to get 90% recovery was 30 minutes. <laughs> I mean, it just went boom right into solution. So... That's a possibility. Here in the mother load, I've seen tailings that were worth four times from gravity to mercury to chlorine to cyanide. Say a uh, chlorine leach. Okay. Yeah, chlorine leach operations with, with poor testing. Okay. Oh. Well, I am going to have to stop here pretty quickly. I've got to uh, get something to eat get to sleep i gotta be up at uh oh my god four o'clock in the morning <laughs> go do some more roofing so is there anyone that has any questions right now that we haven't addressed i mean if anyone does please put them up there and we'll we'll jump right on it thank you rick you're welcome jeff I presume everyone likes these live streams. I really enjoy it for the interaction Ask and the way it goes. Ask them if they'd like you to do them at 6 p.m. Mountain instead of 5 because people started coming on around that time. And Eva was wondering if we started a little early for everybody or is that just the way people came online or what it was? Was it a bad time to start that early or not? If anyone has any input on that. Um so, you know, we can kind of tune it a little bit better. I'm going to try and figure out how you put the little notification thing where it, it notifies everyone that there's a, an upcoming live stream, you know, tomorrow or something like that. My darn schedule is so chaotic and unpredictable. I hate to make a firm announcement, you know, more than a fairly short time ahead in case uh, something screws it up because it it certainly <laughs> can happen <laughs> oh my goodness just an hour or two ahead okay by ahead chris do you mean earlier or later i presume you mean earlier uh dd would prefer a later time So, how about you, Chris? You want it earlier or later? Just an hour or two of warning. Yeah. So I'm going to see what I can, I can if I can figure that one out. I I have some people who are a lot smarter hurting electrons than I am. Okay. So later is fine with you. So why don't we try this? Let's try. I can't do it too late due to construction and trying to get some sleep. So let's try. Um, yeah, 5.30, how's that? 5.30 next Sunday is the tentative time, and I will try and get an announcement out there Sunday afternoon, some kind of notification if I can figure out how to do that. Okay. 
Well, you're welcome, Chase. Uh, I have a, I have fun doing this, and I think other people do. I think Chris does. Chris is a really good resource here. Uh, knows a lot of stuff. And uh, hey, Blindsight, did you just get here? Um, I see. I made it. So you, you may need it a little later, too. Uh, don't forget to email me, Chris, so I can send you that, that ore and tell me whether you want two different kinds of ore or all one or what matter, whether it matters to you. Rocket Boy says you can set your stream time and it will show up as everyone's local time, days in advance even. Okay. Um, I'm thinking if I went... Sunday afternoon, once I knew, okay, I've got it all set up, I've got the day off, blah, 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 and somewhere around noonish, I went there and set it up ahead of time. That might work pretty well. I just, I don't want to do it a couple days ahead, that's for sure. But I think that might work pretty well because then everyone would have several hours to see the notification and kind of get a heads up. Well, Dee Dee. I, I hope things work well on the, the rose quartz there. That's beautiful stuff. Yeah, blind sight. We're trying to do Sunday afternoons. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to try around 530, and I'll try and get a notification up before time. But I heard electrons about as well as I heard cats, so I'll do the best I can, but no guarantees. Yeah. Oh, you're you're welcome, Jeffrey. Uh, I say I have a good time. I I like helping people. I like talking. You may have noticed. <laughs> okay, I say next Sunday. That's that's when we'll give it a shot. And uh, once I finally get mining in the field and stuff, we'll see. Uh, again, I'll try and I'm usually scheduled at least a week ahead of time. So by Sunday evening, I'll have an idea on the next one. But I'll try and around noonish on Sundays or whatever, put up a notification. Hey, you're welcome, Chris, and thank you for all your hospitality while we were there. That was great. Oh well, I guess that's about it. So uh, had another productive day, and. Uh, Write down your questions and stuff for next week if you have any, and we'll try and uh, get on it then. So take care, happy prospecting, and keep it safe out there. Bye, everybody.